Hello YouTube. Today I'm going to talk about a somewhat mundane but important topic in quantum simulation, calibration. Specifically, I'm going to talk about Flocate calibration, a new calibration method that we developed at Google. When I was a graduate student, I think a gate with fidelity 99% is a good gate. However, I was wrong. For a small over-rotation delta, the fidelity of a gate can be written as 1 minus delta squared over 6. And for a gate with 99% fidelity, the error is approximately 0.24 radians. After six cycles, one would naively thinking that we got a gate of 94%. However, in reality, we got a gate that is almost a pi over 2 gate. That is certainly not 94% fidelity. Therefore, fidelity is a very bad measure for systematic errors. Real life is not forgiving. And we will have to target a precision of less than 10 to the minus 3 radius. With the kind of hardware at Google, the room temperature is fluctuating. And uh, the control signals in, con in the control lines can talk to each other. And there are uh, also pulse distortion and uh, gate bleeding. There are four criteria for calibration. We call it fact. The calibration needs to be fast to mitigate the system drift constantly. It also needs to be accurate to reduce systematic errors. And need to capture contacts to capture the crosstalks and pulse bleeding in a quantum circuit. So pulse bleeding is because uh, the pulse didn't shut off after uh, the gate is over, it can have a fat tail, which can bleed into the next pulse, and causing it to have some systematic errors. And the fourth criterion is to implementation is to be robust to implementation error and uh, spam errors. So circuits are different. For example, in quantum error correction, we use a very structurized circuit where we use hardmark gate and uh, the CD gate. Whereas in a random quantum circuit, it's not structured. So every gate has a different rotational angle, which has the extra benefits of converting systematic errors to decoherence errors. Therefore, in some sense, a random quantum circuit is easier to implement because one do not have to worry too much about the systematic errors. However, in a structured quantum circuit, one has to calibrate these systematic errors carefully. So ideally using a circuit that is of the same structure as the original circuit. So here I would argue that Flocate calibration is the ideal tool. So in Flocate calibration, one first construct a circuit that resembles uh, the elements of the original circuit. And then one repeat this element for n times to amplify its eigenvalues. So here epsilon j is called the quasi energy of uh, the quasi energy of the periodic circuit. And after being repeated for n times, this phase uh, e to the minus i and epsilon j is amplified by n times. Therefore, we can estimate that phase with an error 1 over n just. To According to this simple algebra, you can estimate the phase n times 
of epsilon k minus epsilon j uh, with uh, an error of order one, then you can estimate the phase difference epsilon k minus epsilon j with an error one over n, where n is the number of repetitions. So after estimating these phases, we use this uh, as an information to infer the intrinsic uh, gate parameters. So here, as an example, uh, we use uh, this specific circuit structure where we have two uh, single qubit gate parameterized by beta one and beta two, and we also have a two qubit gate parameterized by alpha. Where alpha are the intrinsic parameters we want to learn, this and a single qubit parameters can be absorbed into uh, the, the two qubit gate. And the beta are the control parameters to adjust. For example, it can be the single qubit phase, it can be the access of a microwave gate, it can be anything that can be continuously tuned on the device. So after tuning uh, the value of beta, we get phase difference information that is similar to a tomography. We we uh, we interrogate this uh, this uh, intrinsic parameter sub uh, parameter space from the different angles, and by collecting this result, we can infer uh, the intrinsic parameters alpha. So how to estimate the phase, uh, the phase difference. So never estimate the absolute phase in quantum mechanics. You estimate phase difference. Uh, to estimate the phase difference, we first prepare uh, a quantum state that is an even superposition of two flocate eigenstates, uh, the J eigenstates and the, the K eigenstate. This is similar to a Mach Zander interferometer, where you you uh, you mix uh, you, where you first split the uh, the laser, and then you put uh, uh, the phase on one of the arm, and then you mix them. Then you measure the probability of the laser coming out out of either a port. So here it is similar. Uh, you first prepare even position. You split it. And then you evolve it and uh, the cycle unit rate for n times to accumulate the phase difference. And finally, you measure the probability of uh, getting back to, uh, to xjk and getting back to the state of yjk, which is just a phase shifted version of, uh, of xjk. So by using these two information, you get to, to the information of the probability, you get information of cosine in times epsilon k minus epsilon j, and also the sine times uh, the sine of n times epsilon k minus epsilon j. So putting these together, you get the phase information. So in principle, we only need one of these terms. And the reason that we put two of them is because uh, we can remove the phase insensitive point where the derivative of uh, the probability with respect to the phase shift it goes away. And also we can remove phase ambiguity uh, in, in, in just the cosine theta. And you may ask that since we cannot, since we do not have the ideal gate, so we cannot prepare the ideal initial state. But our method is very robust to state preparation error. Here are some results in the Fourier domain for, uh, for some two qubit gates. And you can see it's a two qubit gate because there are three uh, different quasi energy differences delta uh, 0, 1, delta 0, 2, and delta 0, 3. And uh, in, on the vertical axis, there are three uh, different sets of beta. So beta are the control parameters. And we uh, continuously, we can continuously tune these control parameters beta. And they are, they, they, these are just three um, uh, random examples. 
and the entire depth is 101 and there you can see that uh, the spam the the effects of spam errors are kind of minimum um, because you only see one dominant peak in each of the plot meaning that we only have one frequency uh, one phase uh, in in the in in these phase estimation circuits and you can also see there is a peak in zero frequency and these zero frequency peaks are due to uh, the decoherence effect. So how can we estimate the phase without using Fourier transformation? So Fourier transformations are bad because you need to do many experiments. For example, if you want to get precision one over N, where N is 100, you need to do 100 experiments. It turns out, uh, when you have some prior information or in the Fourier domain, you can drastically reduce uh, the number of experiments. So here, the prior information is that it is, so this, the, uh, the signal in the Fourier domain is very sparse. You only have one frequency. So using that as a prior information, you can reduce uh, the number of um, experiments drastically. For example, if you have some initial pre precision of your phase estimation, if you have some uh, some state preparation error, have some decoherence, and you also have some some measurement error, so these are limit of the precision you can get to uh, to estimate the phase. Let's say that number is two pi over n, and uh, you also have a desired precision epsilon. Let's say epsilon is much, much smaller than two pi over m. Then, then how can you how can you achieve that? Okay, okay. As as we talked about, we can we can reduce the error by by repeating uh, the cycle unitary many times. For example, here we repeat the cycle unitary for m times. So this error region would cover the two pi region. Uh, the, the entire 2 pi region. I don't want to repeat it more because we repeat it more times. I start to uh, get confused of the principal region, like how many runs I have wrapped between the 2 pi region. And I don't want to, uh, to repeat it much less than M because I got less pre precision. So I can repeat it for M times and still um, uh, identifying the phase, but my my estimating error goes to one over m, and I can do it iteratively, do it many times. Therefore, uh, the, the 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 total number of iterations I I have is log base m uh, two pi over epsilon. You see, uh, that is much better than a. Uh, linear scaling we have the log scaling here and that drastically reduce the number of circuits that is needed to achieve a given precision for that now, these um, uh, ideas are not new they were they were used in some of the the, the phase estimation paper uh, and uh, also in the robust phase estimation method that, that, that is pro proposed by uh, by camo et al So here comes the problem, uh, like how, how, how we use this, this scenario to, uh, to robustly Id identify uh, the phase. You can do it iteratively, or maybe you can do it better by using a, a cost function approach, which we find is, is much superior than the iterative uh, method. It is easy to implement, you don't need to to write some code to do an, an, an iterative um, uh, estimation method. You can uh, uh, combine data from different uh, cycle repetition N, making, uh, making the, 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 the fish information large and uh, making this uh, uh, the variance smaller. And also it allows us to, to estimate the phase uh, by 
mostly avoiding misidentifying the, the, the principal regions just because you use uh, uh, more data, you, you aggregate more data. Uh, but, uh, but there are some tricky uh, things in implementing this cost function uh, method. So the cost function uh, we use is uh, we have experimental data uh, taken by circuit depths n, and uh, then uh, we 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 estimate the phase, and then we see the difference of that phase with respect to the uh, to uh, to uh, phase phi time time to the uh, time to n. So if all the experiment data are perfect, let's say you don't have any measurement error, then um, uh, the the optimal value when the cost function equal to zero is phi equal to the the desired value of phi. And uh, here we use a set of n that you can choose from uh, from a log space or exponential uh, sequence. Um, and uh, um, and uh, here are the landscape of uh, the cost function by choosing different n max. So n max is the maximum uh, cycle repetition uh, number n in, in this set. As you can see, as we choose n max larger and larger, the landscape becomes more rugged, which means there are more local minima. So uh, a straightforward approach would be that we optimize the landscape for smaller in max first and then we gradually increase in max and searching uh, the uh, the minimum point around that point so that allows us to search around this uh, this local minimum uh, and uh, and and as we we increase in max, you can see that uh, the, the, the cost function becomes steep and steep, though, we are, though that can reduce, uh, the, that can reduce the, uh, the variance of the estimate. So here is some benchmarking with unitary fidelity. And uh, uh, this is for a single qubit square root x gate. So we uh, so we estimate the parameters of uh, the the square root x gate, and uh, then uh, we compare it with uh, the ideal case. So in the red curve, we see uh, here it's uncalibrated. So uncalibrated literally means you are using calibrated using our routine calibration method. And you see the red curve is not very great because it, it oscillates. So if the fidelity of a gate oscillates, that, that is because uh, it oscillates as a, as a function of circuit depth. That is because you have some systematic error there. And the systematic error for this specific gate, and we can see is approximately uh, to pi over 1,000. So uh, this is definitely not a small number. Um, oh. And uh, here we show that we can completely characterize the systematic error. If you look at uh, the uh, uncalibrated gate versus characterized gate. So here we use for gate calib we use Frocade characterization to estimate the gate parameters and compare the uncalibrated gate with the, our characterized model gate. And finally, we adjust the gate parameter to compare the calibrated gate versus ideal gate. And we see they're pretty similar and the fidelity drops but never oscillates. And that shows that the systematic errors are removed leaving some decoherence errors here. So there are some hidden assumptions in Flocate calibration. 
So the first uh, hidden assumption is that changing alpha cause at least one blockade cross energy difference to to change. So that is obvious. If this is not true, you cannot use uh, the the cross energy difference to infer the intrinsic parameter alpha. And the second is changing beta alters how uh, the cross energy difference depend on alpha. So this is because if changing beta does not cause uh, epsilon j minus epsilon k dependence on alpha, then then we are we are shooting uh, the, uh, the the tomography always on the same angle. We are not going to 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 get a real tomography of of the intrinsic parameters we are always learning the same the same combination of alpha and the last one is alpha is independent of beta so this is crucial this is uh, the 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 thing that for kate and calibration depends on so if uh, alpha is slightly dependent on beta so you need to go back to change your model to account for that dependence. Okay, so here is some test implicit, uh, is some tests, uh, the implicit assumptions. So here we use a circuit of uh, single qubit microwave gates and uh, two qubit uh, fermionic simulation gate. Uh, uh, a two-qubit gate that conserves uh, the number of excitations. And on the vertical axis are three functions of epsilon k minus epsilon j. So we use functions because these functions are smooth than uh, the, uh, the, uh, the quasi-energy difference themselves. And on the, on the horizontal axis, we sweep one beta while fixing the other two betas. So again, beta are the are the control parameters. So here, the control parameter in the single qubit gates, and we see very good um, good uh, 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 performance of this um, of this uh, very good fitting of uh, the data to uh, to our theory. That means. Uh, the intrinsic parameter alpha does not depend on the control parameter beta. So if they don't, do not fit, that means the underlying model that we use is wrong. They would better go back to change it. Here is an overview of the process. So we have some initial guess of the gate parameter. And then uh, we calculate the eigenvectors, the flocate eigenvectors, uh, based on uh, this initial gaze. Of course, you need to choose some beta first, where beta is the control parameter. And then you compile the circuit. You run the circuit for different uh, cycle repetition n, and, and, and then you extract the phase differences. And at this point, you either go back to, to, to calculate eigenvectors again to accumulate more data on different betas. Uh, or uh, you, you use this data as, a, as some te test data to validate your, your estimation uh, later on. And then uh, you go to the next step, which is uh, estimate alpha. You use these phases to uh, estimate the intrinsic value alpha. And then you use the test data to validate the model. And finally, you benchmark the result using uh, unitary fidelity. So here is some example on how we use this uh, to uh, characterize excitation number conserving gates or the FSM gates. So in these gates, we have uh, these different parameters. For example, uh, this uh, chi parameter is called the hopping phase, where we do not calibrate, characterize it with the uh, flocate calibration here. Um, the, 
uh, we have um, gamma, which is a, a common phase, and we also have zeta, a static, a static phase. And um, and uh, for a specific value of theta equal to pi over two, we have the square root i swap gate, and here are the parameters as a function of time. So we see uh, these parameters oscillates as a function of time, and uh, now we know these are mostly due to fluctuate temperature fluctuations in our device. And the variance of the estimator uh, goes to uh, e to the uh, n gamma one plus four gamma two uh, gamma one and gamma two are uh, the decoherent the t one and t two de decoherence rates uh, over uh, four times m, where m is the uh, the number of measurements and n is the um, the the maximum circuit depth. And we can see this is Heisenberg limit because we have one over n squared dependence of variance on the circuit depth n. However, uh, the uh, the numerator is an exponential function. We only get Heisenberg when uh, n times gamma one plus four gamma two is a small number. After that, the variance blows exponentially, and it is, it is no, no, no longer good. So we need to, to just be careful about what is the, the maximum circuit depth that is allowed uh, in the in flocket calibration. And using flocket calibration, we can do um, some, uh, some big size the experiment, for example, here uh, we we benchmark flocate calibration using uh, using a fermionic hopping model uh, that is also used uh, in the Fermi Hopper um, experiment. So in that model, fermions can hop between uh, neighboring sites. We have uh, uh, C and a C dagger being fermionic. Uh, uh, annihilation and the creation operator. So in this case, uh, the fermion hop from uh, J plus one site to the J site. And um, uh, here um, we plot the center of mass position of, uh, of the fermions. So first, we uh, we prepare the fermions um, around some points. It's a it's a Gaussian wave packet, and we give the we give the wave packet some momentum uh, that is a phase uh, gradient, so it moves to one one or other direction, and then we track uh, the center of mass position of the fermion wave packets. So. Um, in the ideal case, it should just bounce between uh, the two boundaries. As you can see here, um, the spin up and the spin down, they, they, they bounce back and forth. However, uh, the data is kind of ugly because we don't do any error mitigation and uh, our calibration is not great. Oh, so first we do some post selection to remove some of the decoherence error. Uh, and the data gets a lot better. And uh, we do uh, the experiment on um, 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 many qubit configurations. Oh, we can see there is a big deviation on uh, um, um, these different selections of qubit configurations. So that's not good. And then we did flocate calibration. And, and as you can see, all these trajectories are now uh, focused on these nodes. That is an indication of uh, coherent error being calibrated away. You only live with uh, decoherence errors that are different for uh, these different choices of, of, of qubits or qubit configurations. So after that, we, we do the average of of, of these different trajectories. And uh, the, last, uh, and the, the last step, we find a rescale factor that uh, rescales the average of the one to, uh, 
to the one that is very very close to uh, to the uh, to the ideal uh, simulation simulated one and we use that uh, we use that rescaling factor to uh, to correct uh, the the original data see this is uh, will not be an overfitting because in the original data we have densities of the fermions on, on eight on eight sites and I only use like one one number to rescale them and we can compare the data with the uh, the the numeric simulation and these conform very well to uh, a Pretty large circuit depths. Uh, the two qubit circuit depths. The two qubit depths is uh, 250 in this case. It's a, it's a very very deep circuit. All because that we can uh, uh, calibrate away the systematic errors. Uh, so finally, I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Vadim Smilenski, Charles Nail, Yu Chen. Drepto De Broy, Jonathan Gross, Wojtek Moskowicz. Thank you for your attention.